Welcome to the NLP View with your host, Donna Blinston. Each week, Donna will explore how the techniques of NLP can help improve your personal and professional life. And now, here's your host, Donna Blinston. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NLP View. My name is Donna Blinston. On today's show, my guest is Dr. Susan Henwood, author of the best-selling book, NLP and Coaching for Healthcare Professionals. NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Neuro for neurology, linguistic for linguistics, the power of language, and programming is really around how how we use our language and how that language can impact on our behaviours. Dr. Henwood's book is written as a toolkit for healthcare practitioners, tools that can use that can be used to increase their flexibility in the ever-changing environment of the medical profession. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Henwood. Hello, Dr. Henwood. Kia It's great to have you on the show today, and I want to personally thank you for writing your book. As a healthcare professional myself, I've experienced the benefits of the tools and techniques you have explained in your book. And it's, well, when I first read your book, it really really made me focus and have a look at myself as an individual and by taking account for me, my actions, how I'm perceived by others and really getting a sense of where I want to be, it really impacted on my practice, my team, my patients and I just want to thank you for that. Oh, it's just so humbling to hear somebody say that. That's what the book was written for. My passion about changing and enhancing patient care, that's what drives me. So, to hear someone of your caliber say that you've used that in clinical practice, I think the thanks should actually go to you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, Dr. Henwood, before we begin, would you mind just telling our listeners about yourself? Because you have a truly inspiring academic background. <laughs> um, I'm a radiographer by professional background and trained as a diagnostic radiographer in the UK. I relatively quickly realized that I wanted to influence more than my local environment, so I went into education, um, a couple of different universities in London, and then from there had a number of jobs. Where I am now is in Auckland, New Zealand, and I'm an associate professor at Unitech Institute of Technology. I look after the master's framework for health and social practice, and um, yeah, I just um, really humbled again by being able to interact with professionals who want to make a difference in the clinical environment. Thank you. Your your expertise in leadership is, is definitely seen throughout your book and the way you have adapted the tools of NLP and coaching actually to fit within the leadership framework. Lead, leadership is absolutely a passion of mine and um, at the moment I'm actually just writing another book specifically wow. around leadership in healthcare. But this book I think, what this does is take leadership at an individual level and lets people take responsibility yeah. for themselves and really make a um, a stand for themselves of what they want to be in the healthcare environment. So it was about leadership, but very much individual leadership. Um, and as I say, leadership just fascinates me and how you influence people in an ethical and morally principled way, not in the old-fashioned autocratic way where you're telling people what to think. So this is an empowering leadership that I'm promoting. I definitely agree with that. Um, I did as a reader, um, well, back, as I say, when I read it back in 2007, I remember experiencing a journey of self-discovery, which had a huge impact, as I've said, on my career. And mainly, it was through recognizing aspects in my behavior that were not producing the results I wanted. And despite my journey that I've been through with NLP, which it has been amazing, I found that reading your book again, prior to this interview, I had the same effect, which was brilliant. It made me, again, look at things, because you automatically slip into roles. And I believe that, well, as healthcare practitioners, in fact, everybody within the healing health therapy disciplines, we all seem to spend a lot of time focusing on others and are often overcommitted with work, with RCPDs, with the rest of the political targets and legislation that healthcare incorporates. And I guess being able to read it again with what I've what I've learnt over the years, it's opened up another level of doors for me. Mm. So I guess my question from that would be what do you believe you that 
your book offers in, for people when they read it now, again in the future, and how they can use it maybe within their team or or um, within the, a wider a wider scope of patients. I think for me, what the book does is, on a very basic level, give people a set of tools and options, if you like, where they're facing particular issues so that they've got something else they can dip into. We're talking about people who are already professional in their practice. They already do a fantastic job caring for patients. What I give them is just when they get pushed into that exceptional conflict situation or with an incredibly difficult patient case scenario, the book will give them a set of tools that maybe just makes the difference for them to be able to transform that situation. Um, if I think of some real leaders in the field, I've just finished a two-year project with some consultant radiographers in the UK. One of the things we did for them was provide NLP coaching over an 18-month period. And amazingly, more than anything else, what came out of the value of that was, one, the sharing of tools and practical techniques, but also that enforced stopping and reflecting and taking time out yeah. for them to self-assess so that they could then make decisions about how they wanted to change. Yes. The, I can see that through your book as well. You have multiple case studies um, mm. and exercises. And as a reader, I found the case studies exceptionally beneficial. And they really motivated me to do the exercises within your book. Yeah. And not just for me, but also to then use them within my team. And I did offer, well, I offered all the exercises out to different people, especially when I was doing um, performance reviews with people, the KSF reviews. When I was doing them with them, I'd offer them the exercises so that they could enhance their own self-awareness. And that had a profound effect on those people. Mm. And it's, yeah... The, w the way you've done those case studies within the book certainly show the reader multiple ways that they can apply it. And, and, and that was the plan. I, although I come from a very academic background, I actually wanted to put a very practical, down-to-earth um, set of tools that they would recognize situations. So we tried to make sure that multiple professions were um, represented, not just radiography, that these were real-life, everyday situations that all of them would relate to. And they might just think, whoa, if only I'd known that tool, I could have handled that differently. Next time I'm in that situation, I'll know something else that I can try. Yeah. Is there a tool within your book that you'd like to explain to the audience um, that would be particularly beneficial to um, for conflict resolution, for example? Uh, one of my favorite tools has got to be perceptual positioning. And <laughs> That's great. I mean, it's got many, many uses, but particularly for conflict resolution. And I think the real um, issue people get caught up in is when they're in conflict with someone else, they get tunneled viewed on their own perception of the situation. And all they can see is their view of it, their reality of it, which might not be the whole story. So what perceptual positioning does in a very simple way, just asks a series of questions in that individual position that allows you to recognize what's going on for you, what you feel about it, and what the main issue is. But then it quickly takes you out of that into doing exactly the same for the person you're in conflict with. And that can be a real learning moment for somebody else to stand in their shoes and to see it from the other's perspective, looking back at yourself you can suddenly realize why you might be looking aggressive or threatening or confusing or whatever the situation is, but suddenly you see it from outside yourself. We don't stop there. We then take them to a third position where we say, imagine you're someone outside of this scenario, but looking in on it. You've got no emotional ties with either side. You're looking in as an objective bystander. What do you see that they can't see? And you get a third perception or um, kind of presentation of this conflict that, again, can generate real and deep learning. You then take yourself back into that first position as you again with all that great learning and you ask yourself, knowing that now, what would you do differently? Always the focus is on you. It's not about changing the other person. It's about you taking that responsibility. And that's what I like about NLP. So you take that learning and you you can even score it. If, if people are very um, 
wanting real evidence that something shifted. As you stand in the first position the first time, ask them to score how big an issue it is out of 10. And then when they come back to the first position again at the end, ask them again. And you'll find that has gone down significantly just by taking that time out to see the other people's perceptions of what might be going on. Yeah, that is a very, very powerful technique. Um, one that I personally use in, as you say, so many different ways. Mm. Can I ask you, Suzanne, how mm. did you discover NLP? Um, I had heard vaguely of it through somebody that I worked with, but I really didn't understand what it was, and I couldn't quite understand her passion about it because I didn't understand what it was. But I was newly appointed to a team for a major UK charity, and I was managing 17 lecturers around the country, all in different university sites. And they were quite a powerful team. They were senior health professionals, and they were very driven about what they wanted to do. They had to work very closely with a group of managers, also in the same geographic site. And frankly, when I took the team on, they barely spoke to each other. So I asked around for an NLP, not an NLP, but a communication expert who happened to be NLP. Indeed, that's Jim Lister, who um, runs Sea Change in the UK, who I wrote the book with. And I got him in, and he facilitated a one-day workshop with my team. And these 17 lecturers just transformed before my eyes. Wow. And I was sitting there wondering, how's he doing that? And that was when afterwards I asked him, and he said he was also using NLP. I let that team run for about a month, six weeks, and the managers started asking me what I'd done to them because they'd changed. <laughs> And I thought, this is interesting. When I had a groundswell of opinion coming back from the managers, I asked them if they'd like me to fund a second day where we come together as two teams, but to be trained again by the same person. They said, yes, please. We had one more day. And by the end of that team the day, those two teams who weren't even talking to each other called themselves a virtual powerhouse as one team. Now, I couldn't see that happening without asking, what's going on here? What tools is he using to make such transformational change in such a short space of time? So that was how I came across NLP. From there, I went on an introductory day to find out more about it. have to be honest, I went with a very skeptical mind initially. I was a little bit um, unsure what to expect. But that day led me into thinking I need to know more, and from there I went on to my practitioner training, and the rest of it, as you say, is history. <laughs> yes. Very inspiring. So you've, you've given us examples of how um, it has benefited you within your team and the team that you've worked for. Mm. How did it benefit you personally? Oh, personally, I have changed enormously. You might think that someone coming through an academic route, fairly intelligent, holding fairly senior positions, is pretty confident. Actually, as I started to get into my own development as part of the training of NLP, I realized I held a lot of baggage that made me question myself and doubt myself. And through using the tools, I just managed to deal with that baggage in a very respectful way and become more of the person that I wanted to be. And so my own confidence has grown, not only confidence in because I've got tools I can use, but actually my self-belief and my own image of self-worth has been transformed. Not because I'm any different a person than I was then, I'm the same person, but my perception of me has completely changed. So that's been probably the biggest shift for me on a personal development line. Yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. I really can. When within your book, you you describe as well. I suppose your book really is very much on a focus on self, offering the reader, as we've discussed, I suppose already, um, multiple opportunities for personal growth. Why do you feel that personal growth is needed for healthcare professionals? I guess part of that is my own bias and own academic background. So my master's study was looking at quality in healthcare and the individual came out as a key component of that. My PhD looked at professional development and what made that effective. And again, the individual was core to that. And it was long before I came across NLP. 
So when I found NLP and that sense of taking personal responsibility of being above the line, as we call it, or um, at cause, so that you own the issues that are going on and you do something about it, it just all fitted together very naturally um, for me in the academic study that I'd previously done. You mentioned at cause there, and cause mm. and effect is one of is one thing that really it really opened my eyes. I know in my training we was invited to just spend two weeks where we act at cause rather than being at effect. Absolutely, and that in itself just it transformed things for me from mm. my for every aspect of life. And can you explain to the uh, to our listeners um, what cause and effect is? Sure. If you think of um, any major situation, so, um, you know, the Twin Towers for America or um, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry in the UK, which generated a whole huge inquiry about racism in the Metropolitan Police, you, you have an event that happens and it might affect lots of different people. People can choose how they respond to that, and they can either say, I'm going to do something out of this that creates good, or I'm going to sit and almost wallow, and I don't mean that negatively, because those traumas were enormous, and they, you know, we don't want to underplay the enormity of the emotional response that was there. But some people do dwell on the negative and blame and constantly point the finger. And it's not to say that some of those things weren't bad and weren't wrong, but they've happened. And how you respond to that, they completely change your life history following it. So when we're talking at a cause, it's the sort of person who says, let's put together a community group that's cross-racial, cross-religious, to try and discuss how we can make our community safer places, where we can respect all of those different cultures. Um, that would be someone very much at cause. If you look at the family of Stephen Lawrence, his parents were absolutely inspirational in generating a groundswell of inquiry in the Metropolitan Police that led to a whole new um, training and culture in the police against racism. So people like that show at a very extreme level being at cause. But on a day-to-day -day level, you could have someone who maybe doesn't do something they've been asked to do at a performance level or they'll turn up late at work and they might turn around and say, oh, the bus was late or somebody pinched my last parking space and they're not at cause, they're blaming other people. The mm -hmm. person at cause would take responsibility, say, I'm really sorry I haven't done that, I will do it for you by this date or... Um, kind of really just take ownership of the problem. Yes, yeah. It, it's, it is, it's a really powerful mindset. Mm. For me, it very much it stopped me from being the result of other people. And it put me back in charge. It gave yeah. me control. And I think that is very powerful. Really powerful um, state to be in where it doesn't matter how wrong or, or right the day is going, your it's almost it's almost gives you permission to to brush off and let go of things that might have not happened in the way that you wanted them to and open up additional doors that you can go through with more resources absolutely so you can create successful future even from quite negative beginnings yeah definitely and I guess it all relates into a lot of the foundations of NLP. Well, it is part of the foundations of NLP, but especially when we look around subjective experience. And what I mean by that is when, we, um, when we're at cause, the way we view things is different. We've, as you say, you're more open-minded, it's more successful, you're more positive, you're more focused. Whereas when you're at effect, it's almost like you've got a dimmer switch on everything. And you're seeing things possibly in um, a less resourceful way, let's say, mm -hmm. which, which again, that relates to the communication model in NLP, which is one thing that you've explained really well in your book. And given examples of how you can um, understand your communication, how it's impacted on other people and how we perceive our communication. As you've been teaching the NLP within the healthcare, how have you found that the um, that the idea of subjective reality 
and of how that we see things and perceive things the way the way we look at it has been taken by your, your colleagues, your team, your patients? It's enormous. Um, and the communication model aspect of that is particularly important in healthcare. If you think of any healthcare um, communication situation between a professional and a patient, and where that can sometimes go a little bit awry with misunderstanding, usually it's just because the patient has internally represented what you've said in a different way. And so being able to recognize that and respect it, not for somebody being difficult, but for somebody just with a different internal picture, access that picture with them and help them to understand in more detail what you're trying to put across, it can really reduce the number of conflicts that arise through poor communication. The other aspect of that for me in healthcare is the importance of the impact we have as healthcare professionals, which I'm not sure that we always are really aware of. So the sort of thing I'm talking about there is a doctor who says, um, you know, this is going to be a difficult time for you as you walk out of the surgery. Mm. Well, there's a different way of saying that. And I've been challenged that, it, you know, we can't mislead patients, but nor would I suggest we have to leave them with such a negative impression as they leave us. So you could re rewrite that in your head in a way of saying, well, some people might have a difficult time. I have other patients who have found strategies for coping with this really easily. And you leave them in a completely different mindset. Yeah. Yes. I couldn't agree more. I find it's almost in a way um, that... It's a in one hand, you want to prepare them so that they're not, they don't go into a, into a shock or a worry or you didn't tell me about this, you didn't tell me about that. But on the same note, you have people that do tell them and send them down a complete negative tunnel that some people can't get out of. Absolutely. I know only well a couple of weeks back I was with a patient and I'd, I'd, walk, I'd walked in the morning and I always make it a purpose to go around my patients and tell them that they're looking better, that they're doing better or wow mm. you look, you've improved since last time I saw you as long as that's appropriate and I'd been with this lady in particular for a few, a few days now and I'd come in and she was a different person completely and when I asked her you know how's she feeling and how's her night been and etc she did say to me that um well she's been told she's got a long journey ahead and i said okay so um how is, is that what's making you feel the way you're feeling now and she says yeah i was told it's going to be a long journey ahead and you know i was hoping that i'd start to feel better soon so the fact that she was told it's a long journey ahead, in her world, that had meant it's going to be a long journey and she's going to take a long time. And she'd incorporated what I presumed to be a lot of negative words around that and mm. that it's going to be hard when the, what the nurse who'd probably said it was only meaning it in possibly a light-hearted way, but mm. it was the way it was taken. Unfortunately, when patients take that on board and they start to act out the reality of what they've been told. So if you imagine someone being told they'll never get full function back in a joint after surgery or they'll never fully recover from something, they will actually believe that and almost manifest it into their mm -hmm. future. Yes, yeah, that is very true. And it's one thing that's been proven um, throughout history, really, of things that people are told that they can't do what was impossible today is now possible and i mean there's so many inspiring people I mean, we look at now with the olympics on all the the um the paralympics particularly the journeys that those people have gone through and the achievements that they're having could be completely different if they'd had a different mindset and they'd Absolutely. taken on board that they couldn't it's um it is it's um, very empowering um, why shouldn't that person be the exception anyway? So even if you've just had 99 in a row who have done it one way, don't give away all hope. Say, but you could be the exception. Yes, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't agree more. And reading your book re-enlightens that for me. It made me look again at my language, which yeah, I'm, a, I'm a certified trainer in LP, and I teach about language all the time. And within healthcare, you're almost you're almost given lines of conversation through possibly the way we're taught, 
um, the way you were around different people. And reading your book again has very much made me acknowledge and just step back and just think first about what I'm going to say. Absolutely. And Be purposeful. It is, yeah. And make me listen for what other people are saying and as the leader to be able to say, okay, so from what you've just said, how could that be impacted on the other person or how else could you say it? For me, this is a core skill for all healthcare professionals and my passion would be to get it as fundamental curriculum for all healthcare professionals before they ever go near a patient. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> One thing that did really enlighten me when I first read your book um, was the, um, the work that you've done around values and beliefs and congruency. Mm. And that, for me, it made me, I guess, it, it realigned me and it grounded me. Why do you feel that's important for healthcare professionals? I think we have to be authentic and real in what we do. People will listen to as much how you say something is what you say. So if you really don't believe somebody has the potential for full healing, but you tell them they do, they will not believe what you're telling them because there's a mismatch of the communication coming across. So we have to absolutely have congruency in what we're saying, how we're acting. If we say we're a healthcare professional because we care about people, because it's a vocation, but then we don't give people that respect in the few moments we're with them, then again there's a mismatch and you won't be satisfied in your job because you're not living out your values. And we do get caught up in heavy workloads and targets to meet for governments, but if we don't keep true to ourselves and what those core values are about respecting people, caring for people, then there's going to be that mismatch that just means we're not doing the best job that we can. Yeah, yeah. Very much links back to walking walking your talk. Absolutely, which is a core leadership. Um, authentic leadership is really, really important. And the spiritual sense of leadership, I don't mean spiritual as in religious, I mean spiritual as in having that deep job satisfaction because of the way that you work. Yes, yeah. I think as, um, as you've explained in your book, being aware of, um, of of your colleagues' values and beliefs, mm. I found it very beneficial when I was doing um, performance development reviews yep. to find out what their values were. Because as a manager, I want to know that they're getting what they want out of their job and um, out of their job, out of their career, or however they perceive it. And cause if they're not, then that's going to cause problems within the team. Yeah, and that works both ways. So while we can do that to really empower our staff, we can also do it to really enhance the performance we're getting back from them. So if we know what's important to them, they're more likely to give that back to us in how they're doing their practice. So it is two-way. It's a win-win for both sides. It is, definitely. Well, Dr. Henwood, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I really could. <laughs> And I just want to thank you, um, really thank you, for being the guest on our show today. And before we do go, would you just tell the listeners how they can contact you and where they can buy your amazing book, NLP and Coaching for Healthcare Professionals, from? Yeah, the book's easily available on Amazon. And also, please do feel free to contact me through the show or I'm listed as a practitioner on the Association of NLP uh, website, which is ANLP.org, which is a, a standard bearer, really, for NLP and a good place to look for a practitioner if you're looking for one. And thank you again, Dr. Henwood. It's my yeah. absolute pleasure. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in today. If you'd like to learn more about NLP, then tune each week and also visit my website, www.donnablinston.com, where you can pick up a copy of my best-selling book, Psychobabble, a straightforward, plain English guide to the benefits of NLP. Also visit theorganicview.com and sign up for our newsletter, which will keep you updated with the upcoming shows, guests and online workshops. In the next live workshops, we'll discuss how NLP can be used to improve your relationships, both personally and professionally, learning NLP techniques that will enable you to see events and problems from multiple perspectives and to find out what is really important to you in a relationship. Thank you. Thank you.